Hello everyone and welcome back to the Leafs Town. And today I finally got him. I got him. I did it. I told you I'd do it. And he's here. What's up, Ryan? Hey, how are you doing, Q? Sorry, sorry boys. It's been a minute. Um, but I'm back. I'm back. And um hopefully I'll be back on a more consistent basis now. Um a lot has changed though since uh, the last time I was here. Yeah. I so mean boys- around the world in the Leafs, a lot of stuff happened, yeah. Yeah. And we're going to, I mean, I've been doing this, but we I haven't done it with Ryan yet. So um, we're just going to do a little bit of a recap. And we should we start from the top? I mean, I feel like there's, there's nowhere else to start. I mean, I think all of Leafs Nation was uh, a little bit uh, ready to hit the panic button uh, when the season first started. Uh, it was a tough, tough round of games. We lost, uh, we lost a lot of them. We didn't play particularly well. Um, you know, I think my first takeaway from the first little stretch of the season when I was really watching the boys, um, Muzzin did not look right. Um, yep. I feel like, you know, obviously he's been, he's been hurt and obviously with the whole COVID situation, we haven't really seen a lot of him as of late, but you know, even the last I saw him, I just, I can't help but feel like he hasn't looked right all season. Uh, I'm hoping when he comes back and he gets sufficient time to, you know, you know, sit out, get his body right. Um, the hope is that he'll look more like he did last season and two years ago where, you know, he was really, you know, the rock uh, of that blue line. Um, but, yeah, I mean, my first impression of him, especially when he was with Hall, I mean, yeah. Hall looked bad. And it was even worse because Muzzin didn't look good. And that entire pair was just was just a disaster. Yeah, yeah and we, we've been saying it for a while now. Hall, um, he needed Muzzin to keep him afloat. And when Muzzin, I don't know what's wrong with him, if he's injured or something, Hall dropped off a cliff, cliff. Sorry, And that's where he is now. He looked decent in his first game back, but at the same time, he was playing, he was playing against the Senators. Um, Short-handed Senators, too. That team yeah. was decimated by COVID. We were just getting all our boys back, and, oh, man, I felt bad for Ottawa. <laughs> yeah, for sure, and for Matt Murray especially. He got uh, got the short end of the he stick there, for sure. Call-up, right? First, first game back from the call-up, and he has to deal with uh, almost healthy Leafs while I think his team was missing their top two centers. Yep, and yeah. it, it, the most important thing for him is that he's playing against a fully healthy Leafs forward core, and they just completely destroyed him. So I feel bad for him. I actually thought I've actually thought Matt Murray was playing like okay up until like the third period because you have to keep in mind he let in three goals at that point, but it was on like 34, 35 shots. Mm-hmm. But like he wasn't outstanding, but he wasn't losing Ottawa the game by by any means. Oh yeah, um, it was not his fault. He kind of fell apart at the end there, which is unfortunate for him. But um, you know, Ottawa's got to hope he gets better. Um, yeah, I mean, this entire season is just, you know, I'm, I'm obviously talking a lot. And, you know, part of that reason is just because I haven't really gotten to talk about the Leafs since I haven't been on one of these. Yep. Um, so <laughs> basically since it's uh, its debut. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of pleasant surprises this season. Um, yeah. For me, at least. Um, I think uh, uh, David Kampf has been a sight for sore eyes. Um He's been exceptional on the penalty kill. He's offered a lot more in the transition uh, game than I expected he would have. He's a great support player. Um, he works hard. Uh, I love the way he plays. And, you know, Jakey, obviously, is a Hawks fan. He told me, he told us um, before the season started when we first signed camp that we would love him. Um, I, I, I believed him, but I was also a little bit skeptical because, you know, the analytics community doesn't really love the guy. Yeah. Um, but he does his job, um, and that line with him and Kasha, uh, another another you know guy that I've been pleasantly surprised by in terms of what he can bring uh, offensively when he gets going. Uh, he's a pesky player. He's got a great shot. He's fast. Um, I really like him when he's playing with Camp. Um, you know, I mean, those two are like the real like two standouts. Um, Bunting has been nothing short of amazing. I'm sure you've 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 you've, you've raved about him. Oh, for sure. Episodes. Um, but that wasn't really uh, as much of a surprise because we knew heading into the season that he was probably going to be on that first line with Matthews and Marner. Um, and that, you know, I liked the signing when we got him from Arizona. You know, he, obviously we mentioned that, you know, a lot of his goals from last season were a lot of luck based. But, you know, playing with Matthews and Marner, you don't need as much luck. And if you just put yourself in the right positions, you're you're going to find success. And he, he's done that, um, and he's filled that role, that Hyman role, 
you know, not exactly. Um, you know, he's not he's not Zach Hyman, but he brings a lot of the qualities I think that Zach Hyman brought to that line. And when you have two players that are as as amazing as Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner, you don't necessarily need to be at the level of a Zach Hyman. You know, you just have to do enough. And I think Bunting has done more than enough. So a lot of these signings have paid off. Um, and I'm glad because we needed a lot of these signings to pay off with the cap crunch, um, especially if we're re-signing Jack Campbell next season. Um, you know, we need a lot of these guys, especially Cap on a two-year deal. Um, Kosh is obviously on a one-year, but Bunting's on a two-year. So it's, it's nice to have a, little, have a couple of these guys that can perform on relatively cheap contracts. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure you've already mentioned all of this, but you know, just you know, just a yeah. couple of things just off the top of the head. Yeah, we love to hear you talk, so you can keep on doing it. Um, but I think the big thing that comes from Kosh, uh, people like Kasha and Bunting is their flexibility, because these guys are moving up and down the lineup, and wherever they're playing, they're playing really well. And um, in the case of injuries, which has, which was a bit of a problem uh, right before the break, um, these guys were both moving up and down the lineup, and they were doing a really good job. So. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, if we're being honest, this last game against the Ottawa Senators is probably the healthiest this forward core has been all season long, for ironically. Sure. Um, and this is going to be important because the last year the Leafs ran through the North Division. And to be fair, the level of competition in the regular season, it wasn't that great. I mean, Vancouver fell off a of, off of bus. You know, Calgary wasn't good. They, they were, definitely weren't as good as they were this season. Um, really, it was just Edmonton and Vancouver that posed any real threat in the regular season. Um, Winnipeg, and, sorry. Yeah, uh, you said Vancouver, right? Yeah, yeah, Vancouver. Vancouver wasn't great last year, right? But and obviously, with Bruce Boudreau, they've turned around this season um, in in the last ten games. But um, what we know is, once we hit the playoffs, is depth scoring is important. Um, and when the Leafs lost John Tavares. Um, we won three games, right? But in those three games, who showed up, right? William Milan on the second line was obviously great. Kerfoot stepped into that role. And then we had guys like Spezza and um, Galchenia contributing, right? And we were getting depth scoring, which is why we were in a position to take a 3-1 series lead, right? But what happens when those guys who had been performing consistently offensively at least all season long, right, are now being pushed into a position where they have to score goals and they have to produce for a team that lost their second line center and the two big guys in Matthews and Marner aren't producing, right, you know, then the goal scoring falls apart. And then we saw what happened in the last three games of that series. We, we couldn't generate offense because the depth guys had already scored, you know, their allotted amount of goals that we expected them to score. If anything, I feel like the depth guys outperformed you know, their expectations in the first three games that the Leafs won. And then immediately after that dried up, we couldn't buy a goal until late. And at that point, you know, we just couldn't get a rhythm. I didn't, the Leafs didn't feel like they were in control at all in that playoff series. And now we have guys like Kasha, right, who we expect to be able to score, you know, maybe 15 to 20 goals in a season, right? Um, David Camp is a guy who, you know, he's not going to score, but he's going to constantly generate opportunities. Jason Spezza, Wayne Simmons has really stepped it up this year in terms of, you know, his creativity and his intensity offensively, right? Mikheyev being healthy, he looks great on that on that line. Um, so these are a lot of guys in that bottom six, that middle six. Nick Ritchie is a big net front presence who's going to be big in the playoffs, right? These guys are going to be important when we go to a playoff series, right? And if Matthews and Marner get in a situation again where they can't find the back of the net to save their life, you know, hopefully knock on wood, Tavares or Nylander doesn't get hurt. But, you know, assuming that that first line can't produce again, you know, at least this year the Leafs have guys that I can constantly say, you know what, hey, I think Kasha can get us, you know, a couple goals when we need it, right? Whereas last year it's like, who in that bomb six could we really have relied on to get us a goal, you know, if the big guns aren't scoring, right? Yep. There wasn't really anybody outside of Spezza. So that's encouraging. And – uh I think it's the type of goals they're scoring too because before you could tell that the Leafs were really relying on their skill and it's not a bad thing. You have skill, might as well use it. But they were really relying on it. But now you can see even players like Austin Matthews, which, I mean, he went to the front of the net before, but that's now how he's scoring majority of his goals. And that's playoff style goals. And that's the type of game that you want the Leafs to be playing because that's where they're struggling in the playoffs. And if they keep on playing like this, I 
do have a bit more confidence. I don't want to say a lot of it, but I do have a bit more confidence in them being able to keep their goal scoring up when it comes to the playoff time. Yeah, I mean, I think with, with this Leafs team, it's just it's just being harder to play against. Um, and, you know, that's like a term that, you know, a lot of Leafs fans have mentioned, a lot of other YouTubers have mentioned. It's just you have to be harder to play against, right? Everyone says, you know, Toronto is not a tough team, right? And, yeah, they're not. Um, but Colorado is not a tough team either, right? Mm-hmm. You look at Colorado, I mean, they have a few guys, right, And mm-hmm. that, that, are t- that are tough, that are instigators, like a Kadri, Eric Johnson. You know, they have a couple of guys who are – but the thing is, you, you look at Nathan McKinnon, you look at Gabriel Landeskog, right? These guys aren't tough guys, right, but they're willing to fight, right? Gabriel Landeskog, as a captain, is willing to step up for his teammates, right? If there's a hit – we've seen Landeskog – get into fights and throw fists around, right? Sam Gerard, he's short. He's a small guy. He's a skill-based guy, right? But he he plays hard, and he's not afraid to to get into it sometimes, right? And he'll talk, right? Yep. And they're a tough team to play against. They forecheck. Nutrushkin's a big body, right? They hit hard. They play hard. They play fast, right? And so I think for the Leafs, it's just more about being more like that, right? Now, when I say Gabriel Anscock fights, right? He fights, yeah, but he plays tough, too. He plays hard on the puck. Right, he's he's not gonna get stood up and bodied, right? He's he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna give you something back, right? And he's gonna constantly be putting pressure on you, um, and that's something that I think the Leafs are, are getting better at, right? They're 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 putting pressure on the other team, and that's important because if as long as you're playing your game, um, and you don't allow the other team to force you to deviate from that. You're more often than not with the Toronto Maple Leafs, you're going to be more successful because you just have more talent, right? If you have the puck, right? And this is something that like the Leafs have struggled with a lot, right? Is getting the puck out of their zone, you know, being good, responsible defensively. And obviously they've made market improvements in that area, whether it's through play style and also through just personnel that Kyle Dubas has brought in. But the big thing is Toronto's doing a lot better of a job of just retaining possession, right? And and when they lose possession, fighting hard to get it back. Because I think what the Keith's philosophy and this team's philosophy is, we don't have to play super well on defense if we just don't have to play defense. If we have the puck, we don't have to worry about getting the puck out of our zone because they're chasing us, Right. Too often in series against Boston, where Boston was just more physical in the playoffs and the Leafs just couldn't get, you know, offensive zone time, it looked like the Leafs were chasing the game the entire the entire time, right? And I think that te- this team is trying to flip that script, right? We're going to be the team that's on the forefront. We're going to forecheck you. We're going to use our speed where, where we have a lot of really fast players, and we're going to, we're going to force you to play the puck out and we're going to constantly pressure you. We're going to play fast. We're going to play cl- close support, which is part of the reason I love David camp so much. He's great in those short areas and just breaking the puck out. Um, and, you know, I think that stylistic change has really lifted the burden for a lot of the defensemen who some of them haven't even played very well this year. We've noticed that hall hasn't played well. Muzzin has not looked great this season, right? We've, we got two young guys in Sandine and Lilligren that we've been forced at times this year to play in a much bigger role than perhaps they were ready to, right? Morgan Riley and TJ Brody didn't really get started, you know, for the first half of the season, really, until Mo hit that, like, point streak, right? Mm-hmm. But the way that we this team plays and how the forwards are finally coming back to support the defensemen, I think it's really lifted that burden, and it's given a lot of these defensemen time to, to get back into the swing of things. Morgan Riley is playing great. TJ Brody is back on track now. Um Sandine has been incredible. Dermot, I think, has been good in, in stretches this season, right? And I think this team just, once this team gets healthy and we can actually play the full roster, you know, for an extended stretch, I really do think that with the play style that these guys are putting in, that, you know, this team's only going to get better and better. Um, and when that's the case, I feel like Dubis isn't going to have a choice but to do what he did last year, which is invest in this team again. That first round pick, I, they might just have to throw that in again. And usually I don't love the idea of trading first round picks, especially what happened with Patty Marlowe two mm-hmm. years ago. But, you know, if the team is playing well, you have to reward them, right? And this team has been playing like a top five team in the NHL. You could argue top three team. Yep. Uh, you could definitely argue that. And um, I th- you mentioned the defense and you also mentioned how good they've been. And I think, uh, and you said the exact reason why, and it's just that, they uh, before they were always under pressure to make a move and uh, do it quickly and and that led to giveaways and um, 
you couldn't let players like Morgan Riley with this skill and this vision and um and, and this just ability to move the puck do it because they just didn't have time. And now and now even players who don't have that ability that Morgan Riley does, like, I don't know, Travis Dermott, they can still do it because they have time. And these guys are professional hockey players. That's all you need to give them. And I think the big thing is the system and that the forwards are coming back to help them. And and then the defensemen, they can convert the time that they have into offense. And like you mentioned, if they can keep the possession, then they've won the game already because that's just their style. You can't get Once they have the puck, you can't get it off them. Yeah, I mean... The the big uh the big I think turning point for this team in, in terms of you know we can play this way and we can be successful this way is uh that huge uh what was it nine two victory against Colorado mm-hmm. um earlier this season um obviously um Jonas Johansson was in net right and a lot of the goals that he let in if Darcy Kemper was in net for Colorado he makes those saves right um and you know that game wasn't perfect right the Leafs la- allowed that that goal. Um, and when they were up 3 nothing, they led in that 3-1. They led in that goal to, at the end of the first period that gave Colorado some, some momentum um, to, to make a 3-1. And then they let in a goal pretty early on in the second period, I believe. And obviously, if Dermott doesn't score that goal right after, you know, maybe this team falls off the rails and we don't see that performance, right? But something that I noticed throughout that game is how aggressive Toronto was on the forecheck. You look at, especially at some of those goals, especially the Matthews goals, um, you know, how did that happen? It came from them forechecking, winning puck battles in Colorado zone, right? And you look at Colorado, and you look at that blue line, you look at guys like Sam Gerrard, Kale McCarr, and the forwards that they have, that's a skilled team. You know, if you if you put too much pressure and you fail, you know, and it's an odd man rush the other way, that's a dangerous team to let go on a fast break on, a, on an odd man rush because – more often than not, that puck's ending up in the back of your net. I don't care how good your goalie is, how good your defense is, they're just better, right? And to see Toronto, especially guys like Austin Matthews, Michael Bunting, you know, Mitch Marner, getting into getting there into the four check, forcing, you know, these skilled defenders into really tough positions and then capitalizing on those opportunities and putting pucks in the net, like you mentioned, around the front of the net, right? Those are very promising signs, right? Because you know, especially like we see this more often in in terms of teams where there's like inferior talent, right? But a lot of times you'll see when teams are playing against other skill teams or better teams, you'll see that you know they're not as willing sometimes to really get up there in the forecheck, especially if they don't really have those physical big bodies um, to to implement that kind of game plan, right? And what ends up happening is is what the Leafs were guilty of last year, two years ago, three years ago, where they just get caught, caught playing the game, right? Caught chasing the game instead of dictating it on their own terms. And, you know, that Colorado game, when I watched it, I was like, this is the kind of hockey I want to see this team continue to play. And they've done that. They've gone on this incredible stretch. Um, Moss and Matthews and Morgan Riley have gone on this incredible point streak until obviously for Matthews last, uh, last game. Um, but, but honestly, to be fair to him, they got cut short because of COVID, right? Mm-hmm. So you're obviously not going to be the same player, you know, after not playing for a, like what two weeks. But man, I mean, obviously you realize there's still like what 50 games in the season, yeah. so you uh, prematurely get too excited about this team. But there's definitely reasons, definitely reasons to be optimistic. Um, and I think the whole thing that we've been talking about for the last like 15 minutes now is just. They have so much talent, and I think they have to get the system right, and they have to get the work ethic right so that they can compound that those hockey basics with their talent. And if they do that, they're unstoppable. Yeah. Um, something, and, and that's the main concern because, you know, obviously Mitch hasn't played in a while. And, you know, when he was gone after that, that contact injury with Muzzin in a practice, you know, the least power play was on fire, right? And, you know, Obviously, against Ottawa, they were, what, 0 for 5, 0 for 6 on the power play when Mitch first came back. And a lot of people were saying, oh, Mitch Marner, like, just take him off the power play. We don't need him. <laughs> like, no. Like, Mitch Marner is an incredible playmaker. His vision on the ice is outstanding. Um, but what I th- have noticed is, at least, I don't know what it was, but William Nylander on those power plays, especially early, early on in the game against Ottawa, he seemed hesitant to shoot. He seemed more, you know, willing to just be a passer, give it to Morgan Riley at the point, give it to Mitch Marner. Um, and I think that sometimes when a guy like Mitch Marner steps on the power play, 
you know, he comes back and he's so good with the puck on his stick that, you know, it's almost like everyone's just giving it to Mitch Marner. It's like, you control the power play. You dictate. You make the passes. When Whereas when Mar- Marner was hurt, it was kind of like, okay, Mitch isn't here. we got to figure out what to do without Mitch, right? We have to be the, the playmakers, the facilitators. We have to generate something without him. And they were really successful at it. So, you know, I don't know if, you know, it's just, you know, we have, Willie hasn't played in a while, you know, obviously because of COVID and the, all the cancellations, or maybe it's, you know, just try to feel things out again with Mitch back on the power play. But I don't want, I don't want this power play to fall back to what it was last season and two years ago, where it's just Mitch has the puck way too much on the power play. Of course, with a guy like Mitch Marr, you want the, the puck on his stick, but you don't want everything to go through him, right? The way I, I liked the Leafs' power play so much when Mitch was hurt was because the defenseman, Morgan Riley, got super engaged on the power play. Sandine on the second unit, super involved on the power play. Um, William Nylander was shooting the puck. He was great as a facilitator. And it was just working. And I think with, with as talented as Mitch Marner is, I think you can work him into that, right? And he can just be – that power play can just be even more dangerous. I don't think, you know, him coming back – has to mean that the puck just goes back to him now. That's the one thing I'm scared of. And, you know, this next, the next game that they play, you know, maybe they go four for five on the power play or something and they shut me up, right? And it's like, oh, um, you know, they figured it out. I was just overthinking it. But it's a little bit of a concern for me. That Like, against a shorthanded Ottawa team with your entire forward core healthy and you go, like, over on the power play, so it's a little bit concerning, but yeah. I'm nitpicking. I'm nitpicking. I'm a Leafs fan. I have to be negative. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, I think there's five on that first power play unit, especially. There's five players that you could easily run a power play through. They're uh, all more than skilled enough to do it. So I think it's just using all of them because I, I don't know. People say you, William Nylander's in the bumper roll at this point, and you can say that he gets lost in there, but the but. Like you mentioned, when Marner wasn't um, there, he used to just like go all over the place. He was all over the place, over the ice, and uh, he, got, he got pucks down low. He got pucks back on the half boards. He got pucks up at the point. And I think all of the players on the power play should be doing that, just moving around, because it starts to get predictable when, oh, John Tavares is in front of the net. He's going to stay there. Um, um, Austin Matthews is on the half boards. He's going to stay there. Uh, if you move around a lot and use your speed and your ability to pass and shoot, because every single player on that power play has it, it it really is really hard to pinpoint where to go to stop them because there's just so many options. Yeah, because you have four guys playing defense and you have five all world talents on on the other side that you have to defend right mm-hmm. you know some you know last year two years for the past couple of years you know the Leafs power play fell prey to the fact that oh Matthews is going to be here Marner is going to be on the other side of the ice on both half boards and we just have to stop that connection and you know we hope we clear the front of the net from Tavares right and we just we just live and die with that because we know the puck's going from Marner to Matthews stick right um, and I think I agree with you. The movement is important because now you have to track where Matthews is at all time, right? Because he's moving. And then you realize, wait a second, William Nylander can put the puck <laughs> anywhere on the ice. So now we've got to go track him. And you realize Morgan Riley's like top five in defenseman points this season. He's been lighting up on the power play. And you're like, oh, well, if he sneaks in back door on the power play. we got to keep an eye out on him as well. And then you realize that John Tavares is top 10 in, in NHL points. Now and you're like, ah, oh, he's there. And then Mitch Martin is the guy with the puck. And you're like, oh, okay, we have to go guard him too. But there's only four of us, right? Exactly. Right. It's impossible. It's impossible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've been doing this for 25 minutes. We thought this would be a lot shorter. But we also wanted to talk about a couple of rumors. So I think we're going to get to that. We'll definitely be doing this because I've been having fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Um. Okay. Yeah, we were talking about, you know, uh, the Leafs and, you know, how good this team has played. And, you know, obviously with Leafs Nation, with a fan base as big as this, um, with a team that's gotten as much money invested into it as it, it does, there's always going to be rumors. Um, and we're not even at trade deadline season yet. Yep. You know, that's a crazy thing. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I feel like if this team keeps it up, like I mentioned earlier, do this has to invest in this team again. And I think two days ago, was it Jonas Siegel that uh, that said that the Leafs are putting the first round pick on the on the on the trade board again? Yep. I think you're right about that. And 
I think before I want to say any of this, I think for this team, a rental isn't the right thing to do, right thing to do. I think someone that you can have on this team and move forward with him into the future is the best uh, the best thing because this whole team is still pretty young. Their core is still really young. So, and they've committed to their core with that signing with Morgan Riley. So, I think you just want something to compound that, not something that you can just have for a bit of time and then if it's messed up again in the playoffs, you have to move on from it because you just wasted your whole first round pick. So I, in my opinion, I think it's something that, I think it should be something that you can move forward with into the future. Uh, and with that, were you saying something, Ryan? Sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say I, I agree. I think, and I think especially with COVID, right? I think if you're Kyle do this and you're, you're trying to add a piece you got to add him earlier than the trade deadline. Mm -hmm. You saw what happened with Nick Foligno last season. We traded for him. He had to come to Canada. He had to go into quarantine for two weeks. Um, then he had a nagging injury that he had to deal with. He came back. He wasn't 100%. Never really meshed with the team. Didn't really make an impact in that playoff series against Montreal at all, mainly because he just didn't play enough with the team. He didn't play enough with the guys. And so if you are going to bring in a rental, right, and – I don't like the idea of having to give up a first round pick for another rental that we lose in free agency, especially with our cap issues, right? If we bring a guy on a one year deal, he's going to be a rental. Um, you know what I mean? Because we don't have the cap space to bring that guy back. So yeah. I agree with you. I, I would I would prefer a guy with a little bit more term, two years, you know, maybe three, maybe more, but that's like a big, big deal, right? If we're if we're gonna go with that much term. Um but if we are, I would really prefer to do this makes the move earlier. Yeah. Give the guy an opportunity to mesh with this team, um, to carve out a role, carve out an identity. Because I feel like, especially with Felino, there never was really an identity. You know, we saw Keith play him on the first line. We saw Keith play him on the third line, um, just to try different things out in the playoffs. And, you know, he's not – and the thing with Felino was he wasn't good enough to play on the first line. You yeah. Know? Um, but we didn't realize that until we tried that and it didn't work. And then we, we – you know, and he just didn't have enough time to figure out what his actual role was, um, and that irked me, especially when he went to Boston. I think, I think yeah, that's I think that's what made it hurt more. He went to Boston. Yeah, Boston. it's salt on the wound. Uh, but I think, with all that said, I think the first person we're gonna talk about, he's the big one, uh, is Jacob Deturin. and hmm. honestly, I I thought about it a lot because if this happens, and I really, and I'm gonna say it right now, I really hope it does. I think he's perfect. Like, we, right now, what the Leafs, they're not missing anything really, but if you really wanted to make them better, that spot where Justin Hall has been playing beside uh, Jake Muzzin, that is a question mark, in my opinion, uh, in a lot of people's opinions. And Jacob Turner, he just fits in there perfectly. And he's young, so he fits in with the uh, age range that this team needs. Um, he's got term. His contract for four point what six million when uh, for four defense, more years. yeah when defensemen his level are going for like nine million I feel like you have to try for it uh, I would I would definitely agree with you um I will say this um you mentioned the the hall question mark if I'm being honest and this this pains me to say but I think in any deal where we try to get a guy like Jacob Chitron we'd have to figure out a way to move Muzzin out. Yeah, and uh, that's the next thing I wanted to talk about. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Right, because you look at Shishman, he's a lefty, right? He's a left-hand defenseman. He has no experience playing on the right side. Um, and Shishman, Shishman is he's an outstanding player. He carried part of my fantasy team last season with Arizona. He's an incredible offensive player. You know, you would argue that maybe he gets a power play spot over – one of the other guys on the Leafs' first power play unit right now. You could make a legitimate argument for that. He's super young, right? He fits the timeline of this team. His contract is a steal, but he plays with he plays on the left side. And Morgan Riley's not getting moved. And I have a hard time believing Rasmus Sandin is going to be in that trade um, for Shishran if we were to make this happen. I know Arizona would definitely want him. I don't think Toronto would trade Sandin. Yeah. So in order for him, the cap to be you know accommodated and just for roster you know composition i feel like muzzin has to has to be moved out and that that hurts me to say because he's jake muzzin has been outstanding as a toronto maple leaf leading up to this season 
he's been an absolute rock, an absolute gem. I, I love him as a player. But if we were to make a move for Shishran, it, we would have to we would have to take we would have to move Jake Muzzin out um, at his age and his contract. Yeah, and honestly, if some if we had to move Jake Muzzin, the time is now. He like you mentioned at his age, at his contract, and he may be dropping off uh, if this season what he's been doing so far is permanent. So. If you really want to get the maximum value for Jake Muzzin, you have to move him now. And if you wanna, and if you want Jake to, Jake to turn to be um to be effective on your team, you have to get him around now earlier in the uh, earlier than the trade deadline. So honestly, like I think for the Leafs, it's definitely better to have to turn, and they have the assets to do it. They do have a lot of prospects. They do have a lot of they do have their first and second round pick. They do have. All of their picks for next season if they want to move those. Um, and then they have options on the right side. Like Lilligren, I think he's definitely warranted a look uh, to see if he can play in the top four. You can at least try it. Dermot also, I think he's warranted a look to play in the top four. Uh, there's options there, right? So I think it's a move. If it were to happen, I would be sad to see Muzzin go, but I think it would definitely be beneficial for the Leafs. The thing is, it would have to be, it would have to be um, Muzzin to another team. Like it wouldn't be like Muzzin in the deal back yeah. for Shishren, um, mainly because Muzzin has um, has a no trade clause, right? Where he 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 can list which teams you know he would want to go to. I'm not sure when that kicks in, but I have a weird feeling he would not want to go to Arizona <laughs> at this career. I can confidently say that. So we would have to look for a contender that needs a blue line piece that maybe misses out. On Shishrin, if we get him, that are looking maybe like a team like the Pan- even though that's a division rival, so I don't think he goes to the Panthers. Um, Admitted, he, he would be the option for the Panthers. I mean, unless we demand a king's ransom, um, I just don't like the idea of Jake Muzzin biting us in the playoffs. Oh, because he definitely we- could. He's good. Which he could definitely. Um, but uh, I mean, the idea of Shishrin is very intriguing. Um, I can't help but feel like the trade package back. I mean, just for just for cap reasons, right? Engvall probably has to go, and Engvall has been decent for us. I imagine Hall has to go back the other way, right? Because that's yeah. around what Richie goes in just for a cap cap match. That's the cap right there, right? With those three players, we've matched the cap, right? Hall's making two, Richie's making three. Honestly, we don't even need to give back Engvall, so, right? It'd probably be Richie and Hall, and then you'd probably have to add that first round pick without a doubt. You probably have to add the second round pick, right, for a guy like Shishrin. Um, and a prospect and then, on top of that. And then you have to start looking at prospects. And as much as this hurts me, because I have been on this kid's bandwagon before the draft process mm-hmm. in his draft year. And when the Leafs took him as late as they did in the start of the third round, I said, you know, and you, you can you can you can back this up. I said, this kid is going to be special. If he can put on some weight and if he can recognize his offensive potential, this kid is going to be special, especially as a right-hand defenseman. And he proved that last year when he won defenseman of the tournament at the world juniors. And he's proving it again this year in the K in the, in the Liga for Finland, where he's been outstanding as a 19 year old. And he just signed his ELC with us, Toby Yamala. I love him as a player, but if you're getting Jacob Chitron, he's going to be in that deal. He has to be he, like, Arizona will not do that deal unless him and or Nick Robertson, Nick Robinson are in that deal. They might want both because that contract and at that age for an elite defenseman, you best believe they're going to be asking for the world, right? It's going to be a first round pick, maybe maybe a, a first round pick, a second round pick, and Robertson and or Niemela, right? On top of the cap filler. And that's a that's going to be a steep price. And the only reason why I think that might be the end up, might end up being the price that we have to pay for a guy like Shishrin is other teams know that value too, right? We're guys that aren't in the NHL front offices. And we can determine, looking at Jacob Shishrin, that he is a perfect fit for any NHL team. Yep. Are you kidding? A top pair defenseman making less than $5 million for four more years? Like, like that's out of this world, right? It's not an issue where it's like Jack Eichel, like, oh, he's making $10 million, he's injured, which is why his, you know, his value dropped, right? This is a guy who's healthy, performing at an elite level on a team that's not good, Right, that's trying to tank, and he's making a bargain contract. Like, like, do you know how many teams are going to be jumping on that? Like, the Oilers are probably going to be in on that, right? I can, I can only imagine if Florida is in on the fence and that they'd be they'd be calling, 
right? So many teams in the NHL could use a guy like Shishran, right? And if Arizona's intent is to deal him, they're going to start fielding offers. They're going to say, oh, you want, you're giving me a first-round pick? Well, this team is giving me their first-round pick and their second-best prospect and a second-round pick, right? And it's going to be a bidding war. And as much as I love Niemela, I think it would be worth it. If that ends up being the asking price, I would do that deal. If yep. it's a first, a second, Niemela and Robertson, I would do that deal in a heartbeat. And that hurts because you know how much of a fan I am of Topi Niemela. I think he's a future top-four defenseman. I think if everything turns out right, he can turn into a defenseman like Shea Theodore, which is a very high praise. I'm saying if everything turns out right, like his development goes perfectly, I really think he can be that kind of player. But with this team, with how they've been playing and how much this franchise needs a win in the playoffs, I would do that deal in a heartbeat. I would. Um, and that, that hurts for me to say because that's a lot to give up. Yeah, and – um, I think you're right about the the bidding war. That's the big thing here because uh, Shea was mentioning it too. It would work for any team out there. Who would not want this type of guy? And um, and it's gonna look bad when the when the trade happens. Uh, the team that got to Turin, it's gonna look pretty lopsided because they get, they're gonna give up a lot. There's no doubt about it. It's just inevitable because he is really just the perfect player. And um. And and like uh, Siakam said, I'm, I'm, it is going to hurt to see whoever goes go, but it's it's inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that would just fit perfectly. Um, The only concern would just be, you know, we don't have that traditional, you know, um, shutdown pair. But if we're being honest, Toronto hasn't had a shutdown pair all season long. Jake Muzzin and Justin Hall have not been a shutdown pair. They haven't played like that at all this season. And the Leafs have done well. And that just comes back to the fact that I think with the way this team is playing, we don't need a traditional shutdown pair. We just need good players, great players. Um, and, you know, I think this is a season where I feel like we should just go for a splash. You know, Nick Foligno wasn't really a splash. Jake Muzzin was a splash when we got him, right? But we need another move like that to move the needle. Uh, I don't want another season where we're just getting a guy who plays in the middle six you know, or plays in the bottom four on the defense. You know, I want a guy who, you know, you look at that guy that, and we go, that's a Stanley Cup move. You know, Nick Foligno is a contender move. It's a, we're a Stanley Cup favorite contender move, right? But a guy like Jacob Shishman is, this team, we're winning a cup. We brought this guy because we think we can win a cup and we're going to win a cup. And I'd be all for it. I'd be all, if, if that happens, our reaction, like we'd be on this, we'd be on this, recording we would be we'd be going insane i would love a player like jacob Fisher on my team yeah yeah and the other thing is he fits the leaf system so well because like you mentioned he can move the puck so perfectly and and you said that we don't have a um we don't have a shutdown uh shutdown pair and i think honestly a shutdown pair doesn't work on this team with yeah. with with the way this team plays, they just on they just always want to be going fast, 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 and um, a shutdown pair that just sits back and uh, and just plays defense, it, it doesn't work. And Jacob Turin, he fits that. Uh, you put him with any single guy, if it's Lilligren, if it's Dermot, it's gonna work. I feel like it just, it I feel like it's uh, it fits the system. And and what's crazy. Is like I was talking about how you know we haven't had a shutdown pair all season, right? Uh, the crazy thing is Shishman on a really bad Arizona team. If you if you look and we're getting the, this these stats from MoneyPuck.com, I'm getting these stats from MoneyPuck.com, great website. Um, I use it all the time. If you sort this season by defense pairs that have played over 150 minutes, Jacob Shishman and Anton Strawman have the sixth best expected goals against in the entire NHL of all defensemen that have played at least 150 minutes. That is by far better than any of the Leafs defensive pairings in that statistic, right? Like that's elite levels of of, of two-way play, right? Because we know how good he is offensively, right? So this concern about having a shutdown pair, maybe getting Shishman is the answer to having a shutdown pair. Because apparently, according to these advanced analytics, he's been outstanding defensively this season on a very bad Arizona team, right? So, you know, that, that's another thing in there. You know, maybe he is the perfect two-way defenseman. Maybe he's not just, you know, a guy who, you know, we put out there offensively to move the puck, which he does do that. But 
apparently, because I'm going to be honest, I haven't watched much Arizona hockey the last couple of seasons. <laughs> I haven't really had a reason to watch Arizona hockey. But, you know, hey, maybe, maybe, maybe that is the answer. We bring in a guy like him, and maybe he can play that kind of Muzzin role that Muzz has played for so long where, you know, he's on that left side and we play Justin Hall with him, assuming maybe we don't trade Hall, right? And suddenly Hall has refines his groove, right? Playing with the elite defense partner. You know, there's a lot of different options. Um, I love, like, I, I think we can't overstate this, but I would love a, a player like him on this team. I, w- I absolutely love it. Yeah, and I think I'm going to stop us there because this was supposed to be 15 minutes, by the way. We're at 40 now, and uh, we could just keep on gushing over this player and a bunch of other players, which is why, well, at some point, not too far in the future, I hope, we'll, we'll do another one of these videos where we just talk about trade rumors uh, because it, it, it's been fun. I've enjoyed it a lot. And you know, as the trade deadline approaches, the rumor mill is going to start turning and it's going to get hot, especially for Leafs fans. Yeah. So uh, stay tuned for that. As soon as, you know, because we're, we're Leafs fans, right, at heart. So we're going to be online. We're going to be looking at these rumors as well when you find them. So when we notice that, you know, we find that there's enough names out there linked to this team, you you better believe we're going to have another video. Yeah, and it's it's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. This is the Toronto Maple Leafs, okay? So you, you don't have to wait too long. I guarantee it. <laughs> All right. Um. We're, gonna be t- we're just going to ride out of Leafstown now, and we'll see you next time.